Okay, welcome to our session. I'm Robin Rice. I'm just the chair of this session um, from the University of Edinburgh. And I'll introduce the speakers. You're in for a treat because um, although they each have um, a whole paper's worth of information for you, they've, they've worked together to turn it into a holistic panel where they weave each other's stories together and they'll give you um, a nice introduction to the themes and a closing at the end to stimulate all of your questions. And they've worked really hard to um, keep it so that we have time for questions. So I won't delay any further. Um, I'll just introduce them and let them take it away. Um, so, we, so we'll have, uh, well, Sophia will give the um, introduction, but the first speaker will be uh, Susan Ivey, Director of Research Computing and Data Facilitation Service from the University Libraries at North Carolina State. And uh, then, we, then we'll have Sophia Lafferty Hess, Research Data Management Consultant, Center for Data and Visualization Sciences at Duke University Libraries. And then we'll have Jake Carlson, Director of Deep Blue Repository and Research Data Services, University of Michigan. And, and Jake will sum things up for us at the end. So take it away, Sophia. Thanks, Robin. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this panel on navigating the labyrinth. Um, in this presentation, we'll be discussing the importance of cultivating institutional partnerships to support effective data management and sharing. So to first say a little bit more about us and the lens we are bringing to this topic, uh, we all work at American universities that do rank as R1, which indicates a high level of research activity. Each of us also holds either a master's of library and or information science degree and work within libraries at our institutions. And I think this is important because when we think about partnerships and navigating our institutions, our positioning necessarily impacts our perspective and our experiences. So to briefly frame the topic at hand, a recent OCLC report examined cross-campus partnerships within the university enterprise. And they begin with an analysis of universities as complex adaptive systems with the following characteristics. So I'm not actually going to parse each of these partially because we don't, we don't really have the time, but a general summary of these types of systems is that they contain many independent agents, are often relatively decentralized with the diffusion of authority, and can be highly heterogeneous, which may lead to conflicts and competition. Within the context of developing and cultivating research data support services within these types of systems, we know that there are various units that are important stakeholders. The OCLC report provides this conceptual model with six key stakeholders, including academic affairs, research administration, the library, information and communications technology, faculty affairs and governance, and communications. And due to the often decentralized nature of institutions, as well as the complexity in the service unit landscape, collaboration and building partnerships, or what they refer to as social interoperability, becomes a key aspect of advancing data sharing and data services development. And today, now we are actually at another flashpoint for interest in data sharing within US institutions. So I would so similar to when the 2013 NSF data management policy was released. Um, right now, two professional associations, the Association of American Universities and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities are trying to spur conversations and progress in this space. So AAU, APLU have held a number of summits funded by NSF that specifically focus on how to accelerate public access to research data where they brought together stakeholders, including administrators, to talk about what the institution itself can do to move this work forward. They recently released a guide to help propel this work with a focus on campus specific strategies. They're also right now currently holding a series of community conversations on the topic. Oh, sorry. Uh, another piece of this renewed interest is being driven by another wave of federal agency initiatives and policies, particularly NIH in, in November 2020, for any of you that didn't see this, released their new data management and sharing policy, which I would say is much more robust and has a lot more clear guidance on elements of a DMP, expectations for data sharing, desirable characteristics for repositories, and allowable costs. 
But what navigating institutional labyrinths looks like in practice across institutions can vary greatly. How do we effectively engage with these groups? How do we build meaningful relationships? How do we communicate our value? How do we understand other groups' values, expertise, pain points, and really the conception of the topic of data sharing? So now we're gonna move on to presenting three illustrative case studies. And again, we're gonna end with a com few common themes and we want to try to leave plenty of time for Q&A and open discussion. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Susan. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Again, I'm Susan Ivey from North Carolina State University, and I'm going to spend my portion today talking with you all about some of the work that we've been doing within the libraries to collaborate closely with our central office of information technology, as well as more recently um, in collaboration with our office of research and innovation. Next slide, please. So in 2017, um, the position of research data and infrastructure librarian was created at NC State. Um, our central IT unit, OIT, uh, was creating the backend storage system for research data, for a new research data storage service available to our campus researchers. And while they knew the backend and they were doing all of the technical work, they came to the libraries um, thinking that, you know, the libraries were in a better position to understand researchers' needs and their behaviors. And so we created this shared position, which I started in, in July of 2017. And both the libraries and, and central Central OIT really envisioned that this collaboration would lead to additional collaborations in order to either enhance existing data services and support or create new um, services. Next slide, please. So there were a few, um, few opportunities that we saw straight off. Um, so within the libraries, we really saw this as a way to improve some of the services around data support that we were currently offering. One of those is um, related to data management plans. So we have an optional service for our campus researchers where a team of librarians will, re will review your data management plan or your data sharing plan and provide feedback on ways to improve it. And we, um, one obvious thing for us was with the connection to IT, a better understanding of what we're doing in terms of data storage and data transfer for what we're providing for our researchers really gave us an end to be able to to review those sections and those portions and offer some really good feedback. Central IT also had an interest in seeing these data management plans so they would know better what researchers were expecting or were, were writing within these so that they could plan accordingly. We also thought about ways that this might help us um, support um, access to, uh, to research data, public access to research data. And so one thing, um, just to lay the context, is NC State does not have a local data repository that we maintain. Um, there was a little bit of thought and consideration when I first began between the libraries and IT about would we be able to build some sort of solution that could integrate with our new active data, um, data storage system? Uh, what would that look like? Um, how would the libraries be involved? Would we be able to provide data curation around that? Um, and that was something really interesting that um, we were really considering. But at the same time, uh, Dryad Data Repository announced their new membership structure, and we were really excited about their new approach. So we have a history with Dryad. We were on the first Dryad grant, so we already had that history. We knew that some of our researchers were already using the Dryad Data Repository. And so we thought it would be really great if we became members in order to provide that free data publishing um, for our researchers that needed a general data repository. Dryad was also really uh, open um, with us in thinking about ways that we might be able to integrate our store active storage with their repository. Um, they said, you know, they, they would be happy to work with us on that. So that was something really interesting to us as well. And then lastly speaking, one of the really big broad goals was just you know, increased collaboration and communication and relationship building, not only with IT, but also with other units on campus, such as the Office of Research and Innovation. And this has certainly happened. Um, and so in 20, early 2019, there was a bioinformatics need survey conducted on campus, and it was um, run by our Office of Research, our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research, John Horowitz, and Eric Sills, Assistant Vice Chancellor in IT that I work very closely with. And given that my position was shared between his unit 
in IT and the libraries, I was invited to participate in a conversation about those results. And when I look back, I realized this was probably, it's, it's what I see as where it all started for us. Um, it was a series over about 12 months of a lot of different conversations between um, IT and research and the libraries about how we could better support our researchers. Um, next slide, please. So in 2020, the research computing and data support coordination planning team was charged, and I co-chaired that with my colleague, that uh, research data storage specialist, Andy Kurth. Um, I've listed uh, our six members, where they came from campus. Next slide, please. Oops, sorry. So we had a few goals. Um, number one, we were asked to catalog all of the existing services on campus that fall under the umbrella of research computing and data. And so a lot of these are provided by our central OIT office, but we also have a lot of departmental IT groups, a lot of consulting cores, a lot of core facilities and other units on campus. And so they're kind of spread throughout. So we wanted to catalog those. We were asked to identify and prioritize gaps. And then we were also asked to develop a model for coordinated research computing and data services, which we have named the Research Facilitation Service for Computing and Data. Um, we shorten it to RFS uh, right now. So if you hear me say that, that's what I'm referring to. Next slide, please. So the, the model strives to really meet one of our biggest current needs, which is better coordination and especially heightened awareness of services for our campus community. Um, we also really want to provide a personal touch for researchers so they can really spend their time and energy focusing on their research rather than trying to identify what technologies they might need, um, who they might need to contact, which website to go to, how they might access these things, how it all fits together. We want to expand communication channels between our service providers that are spread throughout campus so that they can better collaborate and communicate with one another, maybe have, complement, have services that complement one another's. And then lastly, we envision that all of the information and feedback that the research facilitation service itself will get from both researchers, IT service providers, campus administration, we pass that information up to our decision makers and be able to strategically plan for the growth of our research computing and data support at NC State. So we submitted our report as well as our proposed RFS model in June 2020. Next slide. And then we waited. Next slide. But we made progress in the interim. We really didn't want to use our momentum. We had had a lot of great feedback so far. And so we, we did two big projects last fall while we were sort of waiting to hear about a decision about our proposed model. So one thing that we did was we used the Campus Research Cons um, Computing Consortium, known as CARC, their new assessment model to really assess our services and our ecosystem. It was really great to have something formal to use. So three of us from the planning team led this exercise. We had about 20 to 25 participants from across campus help us complete our assessment. We've also received benchmark results for the other participants in, um, that completed the survey. And we're planning on using our, um, our results to sort of try to prioritize where we really wanna place emphasis and how we might also grow and align with our new university strategic plan. And then we also worked really closely with IT because one of the major gaps that we found was there's no clear work um, like workflow between researchers and IT providers when uh, creating and proposing their uh, research proposals or grant proposals. Um, and this can be problematic if we have researchers that are going after you know, very big grants or um, grants that have a lot of computational or data intensive components to them. Um, and so we worked to kind of try to smooth that process. We made an intake form with our IT service providers feedback and our research work with several grant teams to sort of smooth that out. Um, and so we're really pleased with those results. Next slide, please. And then in January of this year, we learned that our proposal um, was approved. And so we got right back to work. Next slide. Earlier this year in 2021, we have a new research computing and data facilitation service design task force that was charged. I've listed it's slightly larger with nine members and I've listed the units um, from where our members come from. Um, we have been asked to operate over about a 12 month period, make recommendations on the initial scope of our research facilitation service and create a roadmap for future growth. 
We're going to be working with communication experts to determine branding and a communication plan and a rollout plan. Um, and we want to iterate on, on different user groups so that we can grow and scope. And we'll also be um, advising on an advisory group or an IT governance type of board for the service once operational. Uh, next slide, please. And we're also really excited we're hiring so we've gotten support for two additional FTE for this right now we're looking for two research solutions consultants. These will be um, people that will support the research facilitation service and also be able to act as a resource for researchers and our campus IT experts to help analyze requirements make recommendations about technologies and propose design solutions for our researchers. And I've also taken on the role um, as a director officially this year and, and February. And so um, I am leading, co-leading with my, uh, my counterpart, Andy Kurth in IT, um, the development and design of our research facilitation service. And um, um, yeah, and once operational, I'll do the day-to-day -day operations. And then lastly, I just want to, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to wrap on just a couple of other projects or, or initiatives that we have going on in the libraries. This isn't the only thing we're working on. So we also attended the AAU APLEU Accelerating Public Access to Research Data Summit series that Sophia mentioned. Um, we were there in February um, in person in Washington, DC, and then we uh, attended virtually in March and April of this year. We also have a new director of research compliance at NC State, and so we're excited to work with her and see how we might implement some of the recommendations from the guide from AAU APLEU and sort of what plans we can have to better support data at uh, public access to research data at NC State. And then lastly, um, we've got um, OIT and ORI leading a data research data security compliance project, and we have membership on the steering team, as well as on some subcommittees. So we're really excited to be included in that as well. Last slide. And that's what I got for you. Um, and so I think I'm passing it off to Sophia next. I'm muted, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Uh, so now I'm excited to tell you all a little bit more about my experiences um, navigating the labyrinth at Duke. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of context and history to give you the lay of the land. Um, in 2016, a faculty working group was convened to provide recommendations to the provost on how the university should support research data needs. And they suggested an increase in both staffing and infrastructure which resulted in four new library positions, two data management consultants and two digital repository services analysts. I was one of the RDM consultants and actually Susan was one of the analysts, so she knows this part of the story rather well. Together, we all work collaboratively to develop various aspects of our data management program, which we see as having three key areas, building knowledge and skills through education, providing consultations across the research lifecycle, and curating and preserving data bound for our institutional data repository. And foundational to establishing a successful program is obviously building relationships across campus. So now I just want to talk a, bit, a little bit about one key partnership that we began to cultivate in 2017, which was with the Advancing Scientific Integrity Services and Training Office, or the ASSIST office. So this was also a newly formed um, office that functioned at that time just within the School of Medicine with a support with a mission to support scientific integrity responsible conduct of research and data management obviously is a part of that. And I would say the way that we really effectively built this relationship was by working closely on a number of projects. Um, first, we worked together to produce an Oxford Press online course on research quality and re reproducibility, and next on a project to develop a Duke data management guidance document. And both of these were a year or longer projects. And through that, those projects, we came to build a shared understanding of the data management space and some of the challenges, each other's expertise. We also really did establish trust and a strong synergistic relationship. And then in 2019, unfortunately, Duke had a large payout to NIH from a high profile misconduct case, which was a big deal to us because NIH is a big funder, one of our um, top funders for research at, at Duke. So organizationally, a new university-wide centralized office of research was created to provide oversight and accountability across the campus, the School of Medicine, and the health system, which prior to this, they were relatively decentralized. And this office really had a focus on research integrity and responsible conduct of research. 
And at this time, the assist office also became a centralized research under or centralized resource under the Office of Scientific Integrity, which then was under the Office of Research, which is now called the, Res the Office of Research and Innovation. And as I thought about all these changes and the complexity of our organizational structures, I think it really demonstrates why we decided to use a labyrinth as our metaphor for this panel. And next time we will definitely include David Bowie in some way as well. So, um, so past Sophia really wanted to do a deeper analysis of these types of relationships. You know, what can I learn from our experience with the assist office? How can those lessons be applied to other areas of campus partnerships? But then 2020 happened. We all didn't get to go to Sweden. It was sad. Um, lots of other sad things happened in 2020. But something really exciting also happened at Duke, and that was a new research data policy initiative was launched. So now I want to share a little bit more about this initiative, which be which is being led by the Office of Research and Innovation, because it's really now a key way we are engaging with the campus community and can have a really significant impact on our institutional landscape. So what's being called the Research Data Policy Initiative has a stated mission to facilitate efficient and quality research, ensure data quality, and foster a culture of data sharing. And this is being accomplished through a collaborative policy development structure. So at the top, there is a steering committee made up primarily of faculty and high-level administrators, including our associate university librarian for digital strategies and technology, Tim McGeary. And then they have charged five working groups, one focused on data management and analysis, one on data ownership and access, one on data retention and transfer, which is what I'm on, uh, open science and trainee engagement. The top three thus far have been meeting with the other two supposedly going to start in this summer. So the membership of the working groups includes a very broad array of campus service units. Um, within the libraries, we do have representation on all the groups except for training engagement. And there is faculty representation on many of the groups as well. But I will note there is a lean towards higher representation from the medical side. So to briefly give you a little background on our timeline and where we're going. Um, so our current policy on sharing and ownership of research records was actually first developed in the mid 1990s and was last revised in 2007. So before any of the NSF or NIH policies. Um, and that policy currently lives in an appendix of the faculty handbook. Then in April, then in April 2020, that's when the steering committee was convened. November 2020, the NIH policy was released, which I said is going to be a big deal at Duke. Um, then over the fall of 2020 and the spring of 2021, working groups began meeting and policy drafts have already been taking form. Last month, we had our first research town hall focused on the data policy initiative, which included a panel with faculty members and presentations by service units. And then looking towards the horizon, um, at Duke, as I said, it's very important that our local policy is in place prior to the NIH policy taking effect. So I've heard a general goal of having everything rolled out by the summer of 2022. So between then and now, we will be refining the policies, gathering feedback, assessing resources for implementation, and seeking community input. The lead of the initiative, John Dalbo, and he's the Assistant Vice President for Research within the Office of Research and Innovation, recently did an interview where he noted that it is really vital that we obtain buy-in from the community and support for this initiative. Because he goes on to say, we are trying to affect a cultural change here and there is an anticipation of some resistance. So I think um, as I look at these quotes taken together, they really hint at the challenges of implementing new policies around data management and sharing um, when we're dealing with faculty who often do consider themselves independent actors using that kind of complex adaptive systems view. So uh, it's really nice to see that the groups are already considering how can we put this policy into effect in a way that actually leads to changes in research practices. And I'm, I'm not sure we have the answers to that right now. I think if we did, we'd be way ahead of the game, but it's a big topic of conversation and for future planning. So what are some of the next steps um, for the library specifically? Well, obviously one of the big ones is for us to continue to meaningfully collaborate with our partners on the Research Data Policy Initiative. 
Myself and my colleague Jandara are also part of a campus sub team that has been formed to focus even more specifically on data management planning. Um, we're also planning on working with the assist office to draft a new Duke guidance NIH policy explainer name still to be determined. We're still very early in that work. And we'll be focusing on education and training. So we already held a faculty and staff responsible, responsible conduct of research training on the NIH policy with the assist office again in collaboration and plan to continue these in the fall, spring really um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so really we're thinking about, you know, what are those incremental things we can do in parallel with the broader university policy initiative to support this work? And we really are thinking a lot about how can we be prepared within the libraries for both when the Duke policy and the NIH policy goes into effect. So that's all for me as well. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we are holding questions then, but if you ever wanted to talk about this, if you have similar initiatives on your campus, I'm always happy to talk to colleagues about this. So feel free to reach out. And now we're gonna um, pass it over to Jake. Thanks, Sophia. I'm Jake Carlson. I'm the Director of Deep Blue Repository and Research Data Services at the University of Michigan. And I'm here to talk about our experience of looking at the issues of supporting data sharing from the institutional perspective. Next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, like NC State and Duke, there's a, a whole history and a backstory, which I'm not going to cover right now in the interest of time, but I will say really the catalyst event was the 2018 uh, data summit held by the AAUAPLU, and it wasn't so much for the content of the summit, it was for the audience. This is the first time really that our provost and our VPR's office really took notice uh, at, at sort of the institutional level of the importance of providing support for, for data sharing. Um, so this really sort of catalyzed uh, our, our, our uh, event going forward. Um, and really, we, we invited a number of, of different folks to attend uh, the, the summit. They got to talking, uh, people who, who didn't necessarily talk about this um, by themselves uh, on a regular basis. And so from that, we decided to um, petition the provost and the VPR, the vice president for research, to hold a working group uh, exploring the issues of uh, support and services for data sharing at the University of Michigan. And membership uh, included folks from across campus, the usual the, the alphabet uh, soup of, of acronyms uh, were all included here. Um, and I think that, again, uh, getting people together who don't necessarily interact on a regular ongoing basis to focus just on data sharing really was, was the important act. Next slide, please. So for the working group, we were charged with um, looking at the, the current state of things at the University of Michigan, what services and support were available, and then what recommendations would we make to improve those or to, 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 um, to expand and, and uh, to, to make this process a bit more easy and, and efficient uh, to, to do. And so in, in sitting down and thinking about this, it's, it's really easy from the institutional perspective to think about data sharing as another uh, cost uh, drain. Right? So it's, it's one more unfunded mandate put out by funding agencies that we're now saddled with with taking care of. And we really recognize we wanted to reframe the issue and, and acknowledge that, yes, in fact, this would require money and an investment of, of time, energy, and labor. But there's also, I think, some positive uh, aspects of this and some opportunities for the institution as well. And first, we really wanted to frame this in the context of our mission. So the Michigan of the, universe, uh, the mission of the University of Michigan is, is there. And you'll see that we really do focus on creating, communicating, preserving, applying knowledge. It's not that hard of a leap to say that data is really a, a part of that mission and, and should be acknowledged as such. And second, we really see this as a potential strategic advantage. You know, we're all our, we're all you know very um, research intensive universities. There's a lot of competition for grants dollars and, and for attention. If we're able to do this and to do this right, this could serve as a strategic advantage for a university. Next slide, please. And so, you know, as we, we all know, there's a myriad of challenges for um, developing effective services and support for, for sharing research data. And we realized it could really overwhelm uh, our, our, our institution pretty quickly with trying to, to capture all of that. So we, we tried to focus on three particular interrelated challenges. One, really, there's a lack of incentive for researchers to, to do this work. So researchers at any given time have 47 different things on their plates. Uh, what, what's the investment or what, what's the incentive? incentive really to spend time and energy and diligence, not just putting data out there, but putting data out there in meaningful ways that others can use and, and benefit from. Uh, and so really, what are, the, what are the incentives that are needed for really to, to have researchers invest the time and the effort to do this? 
Second, we really saw the scale and heterogeneity of research data generated at the University of Michigan as, as being an impediment. So the University of Michigan has 19 different colleges and a number of different departments within those colleges. Uh, at any given time, they're generating different types of data about different things for different reasons. How do we wrap our hands around this and really ensure that we're providing services and support on a fairly equal um, measure, particularly in, in a, a sense that really does convey equity um, to, the, to, the, to the folks who, who need the services and support we can provide? And then finally, there's a lack of common understanding and connection between our unit supporting support for research data services. So again, University of Michigan isn't just big, it's vast. And trying to understand the terrain that's out there and to connect different people doing perhaps similar things, but maybe not aware of each other or coordinating with each other in the way that we should is, is quite a challenge for us. Next slide, please. And so we came up with two recommendations from this working group. First, that we really needed this not just to be a blip, right? The working group, we were charged for six months, but at the end of the six months, we didn't want this to dissipate and, and just, you know, um, you know, not, not to go anywhere or to have any impact. So we felt we really needed um, a, a, an ongoing faculty committee who were knowledgeable about the challenges of sharing research data and to charge them with acting on the issues that we identified in our report. Really, this should be something that the faculty own and drive going forward at the University of Michigan. And we saw a couple of different areas of potential responsibility for them, at least initially. One, to develop an understanding of the researcher experience in navigating through these particular, these particular requirements from funding agencies and from publishers. How are researchers actually doing this work on a day-to-day -day basis? And where are they stymied or where, where do they see gaps in terms of what we provide as support. Second, we really wanted to spend some time and effort developing a set of institutional values and norms around data sharing. So again, if we are saying that this is something that, that we really value at the University of Michigan and we really should be doing, how do we actually articulate those values in a way that, that uh, folks can, can rally around and, and see benefit from? Um, and then finally, can we look at the policies that we have with regards to, to data and really look at where do they fall short or where we need to, to improve them? I think like most universities, we do have policies with, with data, but they tend to be more focused or more written from the administrative perspective rather than from the research perspective. And so really taking some time to address and think about informed by values and informed by daily day-to-day -day experiences, what should our policies be and how to implement those? Next slide, please. So our second recommendation was to form a parallel group comprised of folks who provide services and support for data sharing at the University of Michigan. Um, and here again, really, the, the idea is to get people together and on a more ongoing basis to coordinate and collaborate with each other. And here, too, we put forth some areas of responsibility. So first, getting an inventory of services. What is it that's available to researchers and when at the University of Michigan? And how do we connect researchers with those services more effectively? Second. Um, can we do some inventorying of, of what we're producing at the University of Michigan in terms of the research data? Again, 19 different colleges, very vast terrain. How do we understand what it is that we're actually generating and um, how do we need to, to provide support for, for what, we're, what we're doing? Um, then we also thought that developing machine actionable data management plans um, was a really good idea. So we, we gather information from researchers about what they plan to do with data but it's locked away in you know, a two page virtual document somewhere. It's really hard to make use of what they're actually telling us. And so there's, there's lots of, you know, there's, there's I think some efforts um, nationally and internationally to look at machine actual data management plans. Can we start to look at what that might mean locally? What information might we wanna capture from researchers and to incorporate in our systems so that they in turn can get referred to services and support. We also thought about storage needs. Um, a lot of attention is given to active data storage needs. So when the data is being developed, but we also saw a need to encourage people to think about what happens after the data are developed. What about support for storage with, with sharing and preserving data? And then finally, um, we offer educational programming across campus, but we don't do it really in a connected or coordinated fashion. And can we do more of that in order to, again, ensure more cohesiveness and collaboration in the services and support we provide? Next slide, please. So we, we, we submitted a report in November 2019, felt great about it. Next slide, please. 
But then, of course, 2020 happened and sucked all the oxygen out of the room. So COVID obviously was was a big, um, big hit for us. It was really hard to talk about anything else during the COVID pandemic. The other thing for us in 2020 is that the provost and the vice president, vice president for research who charged our working group, um, both no longer are at the University of Michigan. So we had to reestablish or reconnect to the folks who hold those positions now. Next slide, please. But we're not done, right? So we 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 um, didn't get our recommendations approved. I must admit, I'm, I'm jealous of Sophia and Susan for for seeing that process through. We're still very confident um, we can make progress here. And at, at the, the larger institutional level, the release of the AAU APLU report has really renewed interest and, and sparked uh, additional conversations. But we're not, we're not relying solely on that, on solely institutional approval. Um, we are doing a number of, of side projects uh, to help sort of um, keep momentum going on the areas of need that we identified. We've also released um, our report uh, um, publicly so that we can stimulate conversation not just, again, with the provost or with the VPR, but with other folks across the university. Next slide, please. So one of the projects that we're working on now is analyzing data management plans from the institutional perspective. Um, I've been able to negotiate access to uh, data management plans uh, from the, the university as part of the, the work that I do as a repository manager. Um, we're looking at them collectively for the past uh, year or so to see what information is, is, is in those plans with regards to the, the bullet points that I have listed there. And what can we learn or, or take from that? as well as what gaps in our information are there, what might we need to try to gather um, outside of a data management plan, again, to, to fully inform the institution about providing support and services. Next slide, please. We're also looking at um, exploring more about the faculty experience with, with sharing data. We selected three departments to work with, um, our Earth and Environmental Sciences Department, our Cardiology Department, and the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. We're interested in learning about We've already done some work about actually um, determining where they publish and where their funding sources are. And then what are the policies attached to each, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, that talk about uh, data sharing requirements. And then we hope to interview researchers over the summer uh, from these departments to learn more about their experiences in navigating through these policies, again, to get a sense of their day-to-day -day work and where they're, they're feeling challenged or feeling stymied. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, we want to do a little bit more um, connecting uh, of uh, service support units uh, from across campus. So our uh, Office of um, Sponsored Projects has a really nice sort of project lifecycle model. And their website is organized in which you, know, you, can, you can find resources and support for where you are at, at the project lifecycle. And so we thought, well, what if we did something similar but had research data as the center of that? What might that, that research data lifecycle look like across the University of Michigan? So what we're doing now is reaching out to different units that provide support or, or in university administration and to present them with sort of a generic research data lifecycle model. And then to ask them, well, what activities should happen at each stage of that model? And then which unit, your unit or another unit, has responsibility for fulfilling those particular activities? What we're hoping to do is get a sense of how much commonality and, and um, uniformity there is across people's responses or where there's significant differences that we might need to account for. Again, to start you know, developing a, a clearer picture as to the current state of support and where we might look to, to work more closely together. Next slide, please. Okay, so that wraps up the University of Michigan um, uh, portion of, of this presentation. As I mentioned, our working group report on data sharing is available on our Deep Blue repository. Uh, the, the URL is there, and I can throw that into chat if people are interested. Um, but I want to go through and, and get quickly to um, some of the themes that, that we noticed just in putting this presentation together, and then turn it over to you for, for your questions. Um, so we, we came up with sort of three large themes, and certainly there's, there's more um, than that. Um, but these are the ones just to, to focus on initially. First, we really see an opportunity to increase visibility and opportunities for, for data sharing and data sharing support. As Sophia mentioned in the introduction, the new NIH policy really is getting people talking. The AAU APLU's efforts really is, is involving an audience uh, in, in ways, a new audience in ways that I have not heard before. Uh, so that's, that's been a big deal for us at the University of Michigan and for, for Duke and NC State as well. 
Uh, we've also seen an uptick in campus working groups and shared initiatives like the ones that we're presenting here. And I'm sure that many of you are also a part of, of those initiatives and are hoping that that'll come up in the, uh, the, the Q&A session. Um, but really relationship building is at the, the heart of these efforts, building familiarity, understanding the work that, that's being done by the different units and, and learning to trust uh, each other uh, as we get to know each other and, and build confidence in, in the connections that we have. Um, sharing information really is an initial activity, getting to know each other and, and figuring each other out. But as you heard from, from, hopefully from the three of us, really building up to get to the point where we're sharing resources in ways that we haven't before. And even you know, in NC State's uh, case, staff um, being supported by, by multiple agencies uh, across campus, which is really cool. And we're seeing a, a trajectory towards going from personal relationships of me knowing somebody in the VPR's office or, uh, or somebody higher up in, in IT to the point where we're starting to have organizationally based relationships. Uh, the challenge with personal relationships is if somebody leaves, then you're kind of out of luck. So we're trying really to get to the point where we have organizational relationships that will stand the test of time and endure beyond uh, position and, and staff change. And then finally, really uh, university policies as a central issue in, in all of this and having them based on universities values and, and, and culture, really having them reflect what it is that, that is done on the ground and, and where um, our values lie. But, but policies alone are not enough, right? So uh, I doubt that uh, faculty at the University of Michigan really read through our policies you know, on, a, on a regular basis and have a clear understanding of them. The question really is, how do we put our policies into practice? And again, with the initiatives that we're talking about here, I think that really is a part of it. So policies sort of set the stage, but then how do we implement them and, and go forward? And I think with that, we're ready for Q&A. Okay, thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. And as I, as I promised the audience, there was a great intro and sum up to bring the themes together. Um, so we've had a bunch of questions come in and some people who can uh, multitask then and type as well as be a presenter. Uh, Sophia wasn't able to get to hers yet because she's she's been managing the slides. Um, I know that Susan has been able to already answer some in the chat. And there's some specific ones for Jake, I noticed at the bottom. So maybe he'll be able to do the same for some of those. So I'll go to the first general question, um, which is for all the panelists. When staffing is too low to give ongoing personalized consultation, do the panelists have suggestions for alternatives from Ann Glusker? Yeah, I, th I think our strategy at the University of Michigan has can we can we recruit more folks to, to be a part of the work right so um, we have uh, my, my department is a staff of four and we oversee two repositories, as well as doing research data services. Um, the intent is can we can we bring in you know working with library liaisons or working with um, IT folks in, 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 in the departments that we're, we're, we're servicing, can we help them, um, you know, look for particular aspects that that they can do or they can take on. So it's not just one person or one department shouldering the load, but we've got a distributed uh, work. And that, you know, it, it works better in some cases than others. And there's a lot of, of lifting in terms of how do we get to the point where we all have a shared understanding of, of what the, the work is and how can we, we can do it together. So it, it's, it's not an easy situation. Yeah, Jake, that's been our approach at NC State too, in terms of data support within the libraries. We have a research data committee that was put together back in 2012-2013, um, and it's just uh, rotating membership. We just try to sort of um, train everybody on, on the data support that we provide and on, on just best practices for data within the libraries. In terms of what we're working on with um, a shared collaborative new service, um, I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, I, I answered one of the questions about how we're, we're trying to be really thoughtful about how we will become operational and how we will grow in order to scale for that because you know one of the main things here is a personal touch and a per personal person and not just the ticketing system so we need to start small enough where we're not overwhelmed where we can give that kind of support that we're envisioning and then grow from there. I think those answers were amazing. So I'm not gonna add on any more besides the fact that I, I do wanna recognize at Duke, we knew how lucky we were to get the funding for the support and positions that we did. And 
Um, we're very thankful for that. And I think the collaborative model though, and being able to harness the network of folks across the university that may be able to help with these types of consultations and not just looking at it as a, like the library's role to, you know, fill that space can also be an effective um, mechanism for, you know, making sure that we can provide that personalized consultation at scale, um, even when it, it may be very difficult with our current resources, particularly within libraries. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Sophia, there is a very quick one there for you about um, if, whether the reproducibility course materials are available. They are, and I can get the, I'll grab the link um, later. I'll grab it in just a second. They are, sadly, um, not open access, which um, pains me, pains me to say that. But if your university has a uh, membership with Oxford um, Press, it's through Epigeum. So I can, I can grab that link in a moment. Uh, it was, that was one of the things, just as an aside, that did pain me. But there was such a payoff of collaborating with the assist office that for our office, you know, um, it's, it's also something that was very much a Duke resource that was already being subscribed to there. So we saw it as an institutional resource, but um, I do believe strongly in open access. So apologize for that. Uh, don't apologize for publishing. Um, <laughs> so uh, Amber Leahy, Leahy has a question. Are, are you collaborating across campus on storage, active repository, long-term sensitive, and what are the pain points? Great question. Um, I can answer for NC State right now. Um, I mentioned um, my first position at NC State was with the unit within our central IT that was um, uh, developing a research data storage system, um, basically for all of campus. Um, this is just basically what we think of as active storage. Um, it was brand new at the time. It was it was uh, developed actually only for funded projects. We've moved away from that model. Um, it's it's available to anyone who who needs it now um, as well as additional extra space for pro funded projects um, up to a certain amount for free. I think it's right now around, to, we usually can give like 10 to 20 terabytes before we start charging on those. But anyhow, um, and so that's just active, but in terms of secure research um, storage, we have a group also within our central IT that's developed a secure university research environment for DOD and DOE funding. Um, we have a lot of that at NC State. Um, and so they really handle that and security and compliance unit. Um, but we're trying to build those relationships. So we, you know, talk about workflows with them, Office of Research and the libraries about um, how to support all of that. Um, like I said, we don't have a data repository. And so the libraries is really interested in working with others to think about public access to research data, but we're just in a unique position, I think, well, in terms of the other two panelists, at least, that we don't have a, a data repository that we maintain. Um, and so I'll let the others talk. Well, I can answer for Duke. Um, I think one of the, yes, we do have our own institutional data repository. Some of the funding for that storage is coming from the, the university and also supported by the School of Medicine. So some of our funding lines are not just from like a library allocation, which is nice. Um, and for sensitive data, we also have a protected research data network that is now been centralized under our office of research. Um, and then there's a protected analytic computing environment for the medical side. So for active research, for sensitive data, that storage is um, relatively covered right now by active by by service our service profile at the university. Um, I think the main pain point is more how do we retain data past that active stage, especially if it is restricted or sensitive, and how do we do that effectively? So there's been conversations around you know, dark archiving, dark archiving for sensitive data. And I think that's an area where we're still looking for, um, definitely seeing our campus partners and thinking strategically about how um, we might partner to address those needs. Yeah, I, I think similar to Sophia, you know, we, we have a good, um, a good allocation of storage to support our repository. Um, I think we've been able to, to to ramp up where we've needed to. We're, we're able to take in some some large data sets. I think we have roughly 20 terabytes worth of data right now in our repository, and we've had to negotiate, you know, getting getting that that access, and that's that's gone fairly well overall. I think the, the larger question for us is how do we 
connect with active storage, connect active storage to our repository effectively. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have uh, a data workflow specialist as one of the positions in, in the library to really look at, um, can we move data over from point A where it's actively being developed to point B or repository with, with losing as little as possible. Thank you. Um, just going around different um, uh, different questions here. Um, there was one more recent one I was going to grab. Uh, no, I lost it. So, uh, what are some trends or lessons you found in working with researchers when reviewing data management plans? Does anybody have experience to share with that? I think data management plans for me are a little frustrating um, because they're they're written they're written for a purpose that makes them less useful than they ought to be, right? So the the purpose of a data management plan is to include it as part of a a grant proposal. Somebody at the NSF or NIH or wherever is going to go through it and say, "Yep, I I think you did a good job here," or "No, you didn't." The, the challenge is for me as the repository manager, I'm ultimately going to be the one responsible for in accepting that data and for making it the best gosh darn possible data set it can be um, in terms of, of turning it loose for, for the use. So I, when I talk to, to faculty, I, I'm consciously aware that they're doing this because they have to do this most of the time, not because they want to, but I really encourage them to try to make this as authentic to their practice and authentic to their needs as, as possible. That, you know, recognize that we do have to get over the, the hurdle of, of compliance, but if it's not really true to what they actually do, it isn't ultimately gonna mean anything. Jake, I completely agree with you. And I think I'll add one point on there, um, you know, that researchers never ever think of them as living documents. And I, that's one thing that we try to stress. It's like, we know you're doing this because you're being asked to do it, but we really want you to think like about how this plan needs to actually be implemented and when it changes, like updating that. Um, and so I don't think researchers ever really um, make that connection in their brain. Yeah, in a way that we're trying to think about that in the sub team that we're working on thinking specifically about data management planning is, you know, how can we get those consultants to talk to faculty earlier to provide that insight? Because a lot of times I think we see they're not necessarily coming to us about data management plans a lot of the times, you know, because it's very much, it's not, it's not compliance based, based at our institution that they need to talk to somebody or need to have that DMP reviewed. So it's often the people that are out already writing pretty good data management plans, I feel like are the ones that are coming to us and showing us their data management plans. So um, how can we get earlier in that life cycle? And I, I saw in the chat, somebody said they were jealous of Jake getting access to data management plans at his institutions. and. Uh, we're actually hoping to have that as part of our data management plan um, initiative and kind of sub project at Duke so that we can understand, you know, what do most of these, what does a lot of these data management plans look like? And then how can we be more strategic in connecting researchers to a person to talk about how to implement earlier in the life cycle? Okay, great. So uh, we have five minutes left. Looks like we won't get through all the questions, but I understand there's a way to put it in Quova and, and look at it later. But um, a popular question here, have any of you, in, from Joyce Thomas, Thompson, sorry, have any of you encountered specific resistance to the notion that librarians have a role to play in the RDM life cycle? I, I would say yes. I think that the honest answer here is that sometimes there is a view of libraries as we do books, we do journals, there's kind of a traditional view. And I think that we have to continue to show our expertise and show how we have people that understand data and understand these emerging areas. And um, I don't know if it's been like direct resistance, but there's a part where people just seem to forget that you're providing this service and you have to remind them a lot of the times. And so, um, yeah, I, I have experienced that. And I think that we have a role to play just within our, our space to advocate for the role of the libraries in this space. Thanks. Uh, I'll go ahead, Susan, if, you, if anyone, if, you don't all three have to answer this one, but if you have something to add, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that at NC State, I haven't really felt 
uh, any resistance on that. Um, I, I think part of it might be that my first position was that shared position between IT and the library. So there was an understanding when I got there that the libraries had an important role to play. Um, and we've been making that connection with the Office of Research as well. So I don't know if that's it, um, but you know, I haven't had as much resistance as it sounds like Sophia might be describing, um, or even, you know, I, we just, we get invited to a lot of the conversations. I'm very fortunate for that. Yeah, I, I think we get a little bit, but mostly on an individual level. And it just, it really depends on personality of, of, of the researcher or the research team. I think mostly it's researchers are happy to have whatever help they can get in, in making these things happen, um, particularly in, in satisfying compliance. Uh, and so by and large, we, we haven't had a large amount of resistance. I, I think we've had, actually had sort of the opposite problem of there's too much expectation that we'll be able to do everything or, or, or you know, uh, particular things only for them. And again, you know, we're a mighty team of four and we have a lot of responsibilities to, to cover. So I, I don't think we want to get into the situation where we're, we're taking on too much of a burden or taking on too much ownership of, of the process because we, we don't have the capacity to follow through as the library itself. Thanks. Um, so there's a popular question here for Jake, but you're all welcome to take a crack at it. Um, about the data inventory. So how is that inventory of UM data sets going or how do you plan to coordinate it when it does start? Yeah, well, that was one of the, um, the part of the recommendations that we had um, with regards to, to um, the, the, um, the, the group of service providers getting together. So it, 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 that hasn't started. Um, and yes, that would be, it's, it's gonna be a very large undertaking um, when and if it, it, it does happen. And uh, I don't think we'll try to take it all at once. I'd imagine we'll probably try to work with a particular college who's sympathetic or, or eager to, to connect with us. But again, it, it hasn't happened yet. So I, I can't answer that question directly. Okay. Um, so, two minutes left. Uh, here's one uh, for all of you from Karen Hoganboom. For any all of you, how do you identify stakeholders on campus, particularly on a large complex campus? How do you keep up with services being offered at other places on campus? It's hard. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I know we don't have much time, but uh, it's one of the hardest things that we've um, just sort of tried to tackle. It's one of the first things we had to do when we were uh, formed last year, and it continues to be a challenge. Um, but, you know, it just it takes time, um, a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, others? Yeah, I, I would agree. It's it's really hard to do, and I'm, I'm sure we're not doing a great job of it right now. So it, one of the reasons we made the recommendation that we did for sort of a, a group of, of service units getting together on a regular basis is for that very reason, right? To keep each other appraised as to what what do things look like from your vantage point? Are there new services that you're spinning up? Are there new resources available that we all ought to be aware of? Um, so again, that's that's our hope that we'll get to that point where we have better communication and better coordination. Yeah, I know we're at hot time. It's hard. That's all I got. <laughs> well, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, it says I'm muted, but I don't look muted. Thank you, everybody, for, for um, so many great questions. Thanks to the panel for so many great answers. And we'll, we'll see you at other parts of the conference. So thanks for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.